Let's talk today about this wave of orbs that we're getting across Pennsylvania. There, some are white, some are red, some are orange, but we're getting a lot of cases in Pennsylvania right now that have these orbs in the sky and they're being seen by multiple witnesses. What I want to do is I want to start off with three very prominent cases that we've had just recently in Pennsylvania and we'll go over the details for it. This case, which is case number 57833, and again, for anyone who's a member of MUFON, they can just go to the website, look up case number 57833, and they can see the case. Mm -hmm. If there's pictures or video downloaded, they can also look at the video. Mm -hmm. And some of these cases, uh, like this one, have made uh, national news. <laughs> They've been on national news stations showing, showing the video. So what we have on this case, 57833, we have four witnesses, a husband and wife and two tenants. They're out around midnight just having a cigarette, speaking. There's four witnesses. Uh, this took place at midnight on June 29th. They look up in the sky. There's nearly two dozen orange-reddish orbs in the sky, and they start to descend. They're silent. They're moving in a northeast direction. And what happens is they're in the air and they start to leave. Almost in formation, they start taking off. So they, they're still and they take off. Mm. One of them has a problem. It's kind of like sputtering. It's not going anywhere. And what it does is it ejects some sort of material from it. When it ejects it, then it's able to go. It's almost like it was having some sort of engine trouble or some trouble. So this object comes falling from the sky. It's about three feet in size. It's on fire. So the witness, it lands, and the thing's on fire. And he says the fire is about waist high. The fire is about three feet. Mm -hmm. And he goes over and he stamps it out, and it looks like a piece of insulation, okay? So he, he's got this piece. So what we do, like we normally do, is we take it and we send it off for analysis. Right. So uh, the first, first of all, the investigator in the case went downloaded the video from his camera to his laptop and from the metadata he's able to see that everything matches up to what he said the time it hasn't been edited there's all that information is on every camera every handheld camera every video camera right. every phone camera and uh, you know what I described to you is about 30 seconds into into this uh, video uh, it's, it's really got the investigator perplexed as to what this is. So we send it off for investigation. And, and what I'm saying here may be a piece of a UFO. It's either from a military project, a craft, or a UFO. So this may be the first time people are hearing this because it's not, this portion of the analysis is not out in the public yet. We sent it to Ohio to Frontier Analysis. Phyllis Buttinger, who's well known, uh, in the field to do the analysis and what she she says is she's got this piece it looks like fiberglass so she runs the tests on it and she finds there's some chemicals on it initially she couldn't identify what the chemicals were so she she runs the analysis which is really solvents they use to separate and see what the impurities are and she comes up with not only is it fiberglass but it has palmetric uh, acid in it. So you got a piece of fiberglass with palmetric acid on it. She looks up palmetric acid. Palmetric acid is used in waterproofing. Normally fiberglass is not used in, with chemicals on it for right. waterproofing. Right. So now we've got an anomaly. We have something for insulation that's, that's been waterproofed. So her conclusion is she says she believes that this fragment is some sort of energy storage device. She did some research. The literature she was able to come up with shows uh, that, it, that it's, uh, it's insulation, but it has palmetric acid, and it's used for some sort of energy storage. And, and this type of insulation that she finds has only been out in the public, let's say, for a year or two. She doubts that it could have been commercialized so soon. But 
it's never sold with palmetric acid on it for waterproofing. So there's the anomaly uh, that we have. She rules out, you know, that it's Chinese lanterns. That, that right, was ruled right. out initially. Uh, so we've got this object. And again, what she says is the fragment is related to some sort of energy storage process. It could be related to the propulsion system. It appears it malfunctioned. They had a fire and they ejected this object. So we, right now, the Mutual UFO Network, is in possession of an object that either came from an extraterrestrial craft or a military black budget craft that they haven't told us about. But it's on video, we have video, we have trace evidence, we've got this uh, object, and for security purposes, it's stored in three different locations. Three pieces of it, three different locations, so that there's no, obviously, you don't, we don't lose control right, right. of this object. Now, this is very typical of, of what we've been getting lately. Now, you have another case, and these, the same investigator, and uh, this is case 60160. Took place April 27th. Five witnesses. They're looking up at the sky. They see nine or ten of these orbs in the sky they're stationary. So again, same investigator, he downloads the video off, off of the camera. He says the video's authentic. It hasn't been uh, tampered with. They're red, red and orange type orbs is what's being seen. They're silent. And his comment here is that it's similar to the Claremont case that I just told you about, case 57833. And again, like I said, we, we got the information off his camera and we know that it's authentic. The last case I want to bring to your attention, uh, which is very significant, this case made the cover of October's Mutual UFO Network Journal. So for anyone who's a uh, member of MUFON, like you, we get this magazine delivered monthly. And this was the cover of the uh, magazine. And anybody who becomes a member will get the monthly magazine. But I want to cover this case because it took place in Pennsylvania. Right. It's, it's the uh, cover for the, for the uh, journal. It's case 47,000. So again, you could look it up online and read about case 47,000. This case took place at uh, almost 9 p.m. on March 13th. So we have March, we have April, and I believe we had June on the other case. March, April, June. We have this orb wave across the state. So this is what is said in this case. Father and daughter are outside. The daughter looks up, says to dad, what is that? They get in, they, they're in a state of panic as they see at least 100, 100 of these round orbs <coughs> in the sky. The formation then begins to accelerate and they all just take off. If you know anything about Chinese lanterns, they move very slowly, they move right. with the wind. They don't have their own propulsion, and they only stay airborne for five minutes at best. So what we do with this, um, and, and the investigator on this one, Dan Medlicott's the investigator, uh, he makes a comment here that there's an old Chinese proverb, what goes up must come down. And if there's a hundred Chinese lanterns, well, there were absolutely no reports of any body complaining, we checked with the police, there were no reports of 100 Chinese lanterns landing in a neighborhood or in anybody's uh, uh, backyard. So we, we ruled out the Chinese lanterns. And that seems to be a typical response from the skeptics, skeptics what you're seeing right. is Chinese lanterns. So, uh, so when we continue the investigation, uh, on May 20th, in May, we filed the Freedom of Inf Information Act with the government to get the radar. On May 20th, we actually received the disc with the radar, so we have it. Now, the problem is you can't read it because you need the, uh, the, the uh, Raptor program, which the FAA has in order to read it, but we have a connection, Glenn Schultz, who does have that ability. He reads it. On June 26th, he sends the report back to Dan Medlicott, and uh, his title says, Radar tar targets found on collision course. So we had a near collision with an airplane and these hundred orbs that were in the sky. 
And the information on that is that at 8.36 p.m., and this is being read off the radar, a formation of objects came within a mile of colliding with an air aircraft identified as Beacon Code 4207, which had aborted a left turn and had gone into an immediate right turn in an attempt to avoid the objects. And that shows up on radar. We have right. the radar that, that actually shows that, that you can see right there where it changed direction. It was going one direction, and then it had to veer the other direction to avoid these orbs. Now, from the radar, they're also uh, able, through geometry, be able to determine the size of the craft. Mm. So remember, they're looking up in the sky, they're seeing this little white object. So from the radar, they determine the size of these orbs to be 900 feet each by 150 feet. You're talking here about a, a small cargo ship, uh, you know, vessel, nine, half the size of a cruise ship, let's right. say, yeah. 900 feet by 150 feet, and you have 100 of these in the sky. And even we could even calculate the height based on that and based on the size that she saw. It was flying at 10 to 20 knots. The typical airplane has to reach 140 to 160 miles per hour to stay elevated. Mm. At 10 to 20 knots or miles per hour, it would fall from the sky. It could not stay in the air. So we know it's not an aircraft. So we, we are investigating this one. We're trying to locate the pilot of the plane that had beacon code 4207. That will tell us, that's the smoking gun, to get the pilot who saw what he saw and had a veer out of the way. There's no other reports on this, uh, but what interestingly happened with this is after receiving the uh, radar, we could find, get no more cooperation mm -hmm from the FAA or the local military base there, U.S. Northcom, that had been uh, contacted. There was an immediate shutdown of cooperation. And uh, Dan feels that we almost got the, video, the uh, radar by accident, mm. that they didn't really know what was on there. Right, right. We were lucky to and, get this. And also, with this case also, they sent a um, registered letter to FAA. Somebody signed for it or nobody signed for it, and we still didn't get the information. They don't know where the FAA, where the uh, registered letter went or anything like that. But They're we know that they that. got, they have possession of the registered right. Letter, right. letter without ever signing for it right. at the post right. office, right. which right. is a whole nother issue. Right. How did they get the letter if they didn't sign for it? So here's three typical cases that we've, I call it a UFO wave because it's happened right, more than once. Right. There's multiple witnesses. This has happened a number of times. Fred, do you have any other cases, what you've observed in other cases with orbs, how they act, what, what's seen? We, there was recently a case. Um, it, it came into Pittsburgh. It wasn't reported to us. Um, somebody took a picture and they reported it to a, a ghost um, research agency. Okay, paranormal agency. Paranormal agency, and they referred it to another um, website. And I seen it, and I emailed the guy, and he just sent me the, the paperwork yesterday. Um, there's like 32 orbs up there. He said they came over Pittsburgh, it's been two or three times they've come over. So I gotta get a hold of him and find out, and I'm gonna get a report and make a report up. But we've been noticing quite a bit of orbs all over United States right now. West Virginia has them, um, Pennsylvania has them, Ohio's having them. And they're all, um, they got, like they have their own mind. I mean, you could actually flash a light at them and they blink back at you. Um, if you watch them long enough, they start dancing. They'll start doing tricks for you in the sky. So they gotta be under, uh, under some type of um, intelligent control. Now, like you said about the Chinese lanterns, anytime somebody sees something like that, they say it's a Chinese lantern. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. But I doubt very much if any of them are. I mean, what they are, I have no idea. I mean, we have our man here to tell us about yeah. them. And our, and our guest today is Terry Ray, uh, which we've already introduced. This is the book he wrote on his analysis of the orb situation. Now, you were also a pilot, right? I was. Yeah. Now, what do you think of the, the case I just talked about uh, of a pilot, and he's, he's going into a turn, sees the orbs, and he's got a you know, make a, a, a yeah. veer sharply. I mean, what would you think if you were the pilot? 
Um, I don't know what I would think. <laughs> um, I, uh, this is, uh, you were talking about the orbs in Pennsylvania. Yes. Um, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Right. And um, I had my own encounter. I didn't know anything about orange orbs. And I had my own encounter in July of 2013. I was in Ocean City, Maryland on vacation. And I saw coming from the north along the beach, an, just to look like an orange dot. <clears throat> and being a former military pilot, I know that that's not a color you usually see in the air. Usually it's uh, blue, I mean green or uh, red, you know, position, lights. So it was very unusual to me. And this, uh, the, this orb got closer and closer. <clears throat> and it looked like the setting sun. Most people who see an orange orb say, and it was really beautiful. It was lit from the inside. It was sort of pastel color, really beautiful. And it got within a few miles of me and stopped. And by that point, I could tell it was huge. I can't estimate it precisely how big it was, but it was huge. And it was right along the shore. I would say about um, 500 feet uh, above uh, the sand. It headed directly east out uh, over the Atlantic, stopped, made a, a 45 degree climb up to, I would estimate, uh, as an old pilot estimation, about 10,000 feet, leveled off uh, for about uh, 10 seconds and then headed uh, southeast actually into an oncoming thunderstorm. And I thought, wow, I have no idea what I just saw. I'd never heard of orange orbs. I have no idea what I just saw. And I just sat there contemplating for a while. And about 10 minutes later, I saw another orange dot. This went through the same process until I had seen eight of them. Mm. all going through the same flight pattern, obviously under intelligent control. So I, uh, I filed a MUFON report, and at the time, you mentioned I'm a, a field investigator for MUFON. At the time, I wasn't. I was studying to take my exam. Uh, so I wasn't certified yet. <clears throat> and um, so I filed a report with MUFON. And when I got back uh, to Pennsylvania, I was at a meeting with you, as a matter of fact, and uh, a MUFON meeting, and I, I mentioned to some of the FIs about what I had seen, and they uh, sort of laughed and said, they're nothing but Chinese lanterns, forget about it. Now the FIs okay. mean field investigators. What's that? Just, yes, yeah, field investigators. Audience. Yes. Field investigators. They said, forget about it. Uh, you know, they're just, they're just Chinese lanterns. Uh, by the way, what's their names? I'm not yeah. going to give them to you. Anyway, that was, you know, a year ago, that was the right. common explanation of all these right, things. Right. It was either a Chinese lantern, a meteorite, or a flare, mm. you know? And uh, anyway, I, uh, I decided, well, uh, I knew as a, as a former pilot that these uh, were not Chinese lanterns. They were under intelligent control, and they could not climb uh, and make the precise maneuvers uh, that they did and be a lantern because as you point out they float along with the wind you know mm -hmm. Chinese lanterns right. do. So I decided well I'm gonna find out what these were and I started researching the MUFON files and I finished researching a year later I spent an entire year trying to figure out what this is all about and I found out some very extraordinary things. And um, one thing I found out is that, and by the way, I, they are, uh, I concentrated primarily, I went back to the 1890s, you know, wow. we have archives. Mm -hmm. Went back to the 1890s, all the way up to the end of 2013. And um, I, I discovered that uh, up until uh, about 2003, the sightings of orange orbs were very rare. Um, there were, were just a few seen from 1890 to 2003. And those that were seen were seen in the 1940s and the 1950s, which I found interesting. That was the only time. And then 50 years of not seeing them? Very, very few. <laughs> very, very few. But 
Pardon me? Foo Fighters. We'll Foo talk Fighters? about that. We'll talk well, that, about that. Yeah, that was in a second. World War II yeah. thing. Right, right. right. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, I, uh, I decided uh, to look in depth at all the cases. And there were, in that, uh, the, the date from <coughs> 1890 to 2013, there were 2,055 cases wow. in, in the MUFON files, and I read every one of them and I had a headache. <laughs> uh, and I discovered a lot about orange orbs, and they're certainly not uh, any of the classic explanations. You know, they're not Chinese lanterns, they're not meteors, they're not flares. Uh, these are, uh, in my opinion, uh, craft made somewhere not on Earth. And uh, there are a lot of interesting features with these uh, orange orbs. First of all, what I discovered in reading about the orange orbs, all the various cases, is that the orb is only a cloak. There are various different types of crafts inside these orbs. And the, the, the cloak comes from the bottom of the, of the whatever particular vehicle it is, out around and forms the, uh, the orange sphere. And this can be turned off instantly, and they, it goes black in the sky. They, uh, you can use various colors with the, uh, they some, they're primarily orange, mm -hmm. but there are other types. They can go green, they can go rainbow color. And we've seen those. We have we cases have. where they're <clears throat> different colors. We have. And uh, so uh, the, the phenomenon is worldwide. And Here's the interesting thing about orange orbs. Typically, uh, for, since the 1890s, uh, UFOs have been very elusive. Uh, you know, we would get some little, catch some little thing and it would be uh, like the Phoenix Lights. Mm -hmm. You know, that was worldwide news, okay? Um, and that's the way it was for a long, long time that very, very, uh, the whoever, it was flying these things, didn't want to be seen. You know, uh, what they were doing, why they were in the air doing this, we don't know. But they, it was very rare to see any of them. Mm -hmm. It was a, a UFO sighting was rare. Starting in 2003, up through 2013, there was apparently a change uh, of mind in, uh, whoever these, of these cosmic visitors were having. Mm -hmm. They decided to be seen. As a matter of fact, they have gone for the last 10 years, from 2003 to 2013, and continuing into this year, mm -hmm. 2014, they go out of their way to be seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the reasons uh, that they have uh, the color that they have, and um, they, let me tell you uh, some of the things they do to be seen. First of all, they, they only come out at night. They have a uh, flight patterns. They, they uh, I will tell you in a minute where they're coming from, okay. but their flight uh, patterns, they, they leave, they go up into the air at 8.30 in the evening. They return at 10.30. There are a few exceptions. Do we know where they return to? Yes, we do. Well, right. we're running I, out of time. You got to right. tell yes. us. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, I uh, I have come to certain conclusions based upon flight patterns, and uh, based upon the uh, 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 some observations of where these things go. And I have concluded that they uh, are parked in underwater bases. There are, in my opinion, four of them. One is off the coast of Miami. Okay. One is off the coast of Sarasota, Florida. Uh, one is off the coast of Los Angeles, and one is in Lake Erie, just off the coast of Presque Isle, and they each have an area that they cover. And we've had numerous cases coming out of Lake Erie. Yeah, we have. Numerous yeah. cases we and have. waves. Let me ask you something <laughs> also. As a, as a uh, trial lawyer and um, a law professor, what do you think about the fact that the public is not being told about this? They only <laughs> hear it from MUFON or an occasional news uh, broadcast, very rarely though. Well, 
I have an opinion on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, the government uh, clearly has a policy of um, discouraging uh, any credible uh, stories or statements about UFOs. And I think they, in my opinion, there are two reasons for that. Uh, by the way, the way they discourage, as you know, is that they, if you ask the government about UFOs, they say they don't exist. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if someone has what they feel to have be a credible story, they uh, ridicule and mock that person. Yep. That's what they do. And that's why a lot of people are afraid to report because they're gonna be mocked and they, the media does the same thing. It's one of their funny laugh stories mm -hmm. at the end of the news. Yeah. But anyway, I think the, uh, the federal government, uh, number one, doesn't want to talk about this because they don't want to admit their vulnerability of uh, having no control over our airspace. And when it comes to UFOs, they don't have any control. And it's an air safety issue. It is. It's an air but safety But they, they don't want to admit it. Right. So they don't want to talk about it. And what, can it, I mention the second one? Last, the last thing, we got to yeah, wrap up. Yeah, the second reason I think has a lot to do with Orson Welles. I agree with that. Uh, he, yeah. uh, he, uh, the did, panic broadcast. He did the uh, War of the Worlds uh, broadcast, and uh, many, many millions of people thought it was real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there, were, there was absolute panic. Uh, I, I agree States, with you. And they noticed that. Yeah, I, I, that was what, the, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a future yeah. episode. So if you want more information on MUFON, go to join MUFON, MUFON.com. Terry Ray's book on or, orange orbs are out there. And that's our show sure. for this episode. Be sure to look for our next episode and visit MUFONPA.com for more information. If there's anything you've seen on this show that you want to ask me about, email me at jventury one at comcast.net. Thank you. Fred, can you start us off with the local Allegheny case? Yes, I have one right here concerning orbs. Uh, my husband and I were on our deck when we observed a round, pulsating, very bright orange light. At first, we thought it may be a plane on fire as the color appeared more flame-like than traditional plane lights. We did observe what appeared to be pulsating red lights behind the main orange light. The object was traveling north rather slowly when above our house. As it, it made an abrupt right turn. As it was heading west into the cloud cover, we lost sight of the object. My husband, who is a well-educated, who is well-educated in aeronautics, estimated it was traveling at an altitude of 20,000 feet at about 500 to 600 miles per hour. The turn made was abrupt and not typical of a normal commercial airliner and more the type of turn you would witness from a military jet. We live on the flight path of both an international and a county airport, and we are very familiar with seeing planes in the sky over our home. This was not a plane. Approximately 10 minutes before our sighting, we did hear a helicopter in the sky over our neighborhood. We can all be sure that this is connected as we often hear helicopters taking off from nearby airports. Now that is a case from Allegheny County? Right, right. Now what kind of craft do we have that makes abrupt right turns? We don't. Okay. And it, this is one of the things with the orbs that uh, is very, um, their MO, so to speak. Mm -hmm. they, they make these abrupt turns. Um, a lot of the orbs like Terry, I'm sure he's going to tell you, they actually can go up, down, down, come like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our airplanes can't do that. Okay. And now for our viewers, if they were a member of MUFON, right. they would have access to the website right. and they can look at this case, other cases, right. the top 20 cases every day right. are listed right. there with these details. And to become a member, you get a monthly magazine right. 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 similar to the magazine you see right here. Right. And um, you just go to MUFON.com, uh, www.MUFON.com right. to join. But they can look at the 20 top cases every day. Yeah. And that's, they can do it right now without becoming a member. Right, and the, but those are the 20 best cases. Right. 
that are listed. Okay. Right. Every day different. Okay. So, Terry, we had you on, uh, I believe it was episode two of this series, and we were talking about uh, orbs, orange orbs. You're the author of uh, this book that recently came out, The Complete Story of the Worldwide Invasion of the Orange Orbs. And it's a, it's a really good book. I read it. And uh, we didn't get to finish, so this is uh, episode two on orbs. So why don't you try to pick up where you left off and tell us what else, uh, give us an overview of orbs again for the viewers. All right, well, let me just uh, very quickly uh, mm -hmm. talk about uh, Fred's case. Um, there was mention of a helicopter. Uh, that is very, very common with orbs. The, the government uh, flatly denies the existence of UFOs, as you know, mm -hmm. including orange orbs. But very frequently, when orange orbs are spotted, they are being tailed either by a helicopter or a military jet. Mm -hmm. So uh, that fits in with uh, the typical orb sighting. That very frequently, you'll have a military aircraft pursuing it. Now, I've had people say that it's our military or a paramilitary like Halliburton or somebody like that. But I had another thought that Fred and I discussed on a different episode. What if the ETs decided what's the best way to infiltrate? You build a helicopter. That's their craft. It's flown by them. Could it be that these helicopters are actually ET vehicles? So we we look up, we see it, we don't question it. Oh, it's a helicopter. Right. It's not a circular UFO. It's a helicopter. Is that possible that they shadow their their orbs or what they're doing in their own vehicle? Well, anything's possible, but mm. I think it's highly unlikely. Okay. Um, there they have uh, lots of different vehicles, and they are not uh, obviously not trying to be stealthy. Okay. They they have been for many many years. But what happened in the early part of uh, the current century is that they went from being uh, difficult to spot. It, it, at one time, it was very, very rare to get a real shot of a UFO mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you know they they were moving quickly, they were dark, very hard to see. But beginning uh, around uh, 2003, in particular, rather than being stealthy and uh, sort of in a clandestine way doing whatever they're doing, <laughs> they, they clearly made a decision to go the other way. They made a decision to uh, be seen, go out of their way to be seen. Mm. And instead of uh, in the dark night sky having a, uh, a black vehicle flying around, which nobody could see, they decided to uh, almost like dress up, and uh, they they they're still flying vehicles, but the vehicles and uh, I talk a lot about it in the book, and it's been uh, <laughs> described by many witnesses. The vehicles cloak themselves. The orange orb is actually a cloak that goes around the vehicle, oh. and it's that they have been seen doing this. The the whatever the substance is, some say it's plasma, but I have no idea, so I'm not going to say one way or the other. But a substance comes out of the bottom of the craft and forms a bubble. Okay. And that's what the orange orb is. And so um, they, and, and orange orbs are uh, uh, very, very pretty. I've seen uh, quite a few, I saw eight. Uh, orange orbs, uh, that's how I originally got into this, mm -hmm. otherwise I probably wouldn't have <laughs> gotten into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, they are, they're, they're rather beautiful. A lot of uh, witnesses describe them as be being very beautiful and the best description, comparison I can make is that they look like the setting sun. Mm -hmm. They're very, very pretty. They're lit from the inside and uh, in my opinion, they chose that color to be pleasant and non-threatening, and they uh, they are appearing. They appear almost exclusively at night, so you can't miss them. And they also uh, appear over the most populated areas. 
And I'll tell you, to me, a big clue that they really want to be seen is that there is one night out of the year where the number of orbs, orange orbs spotted goes up a hundredfold. Do you know what day that is? No, what night? Halloween. Uh, uh, 4th no? of July. 4th of July. Fourth of July. And why would that be? Because everybody's looking up. That's right. <laughs> and uh, if you, I, I went through all the cases, charted it, locations, and I also went by numbers. Uh, you hit the 4th of July and it spikes unbelievably. It hmm. comes back down the next day. Right. And what happens is they wait until just as the fireworks are uh, ending. Just think, we probably have 200 million people looking at the sky mm -hmm. uh, at Halloween. Just as the, uh, the fireworks... Fourth of July. Fourth of July. Yeah. yeah, you gave me Halloween. You got me all mixed up <laughs> Subliminal here. message. Yeah. Actually, Halloween, they look like a pumpkin. That must <laughs> yeah, be right, a right. pumpkin. That's, That's it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Anyway, just as the uh, fireworks are ending, the orange orbs pop out. Okay. And uh, to me, you say, you say, well, why would that be? Mm. Obviously, if you want to be seen, these people, these beings, are not stupid. Mm -hmm. They they are very careful with what they do. They know when people are looking at the sky, and uh, and they only come out at night. And um, they fly regular flight patterns. They come out about 8:30 in the evening. They go home about 10:30 in the evening. And they, in the United States, they return to. Uh, there are four underwater bases around the United States, and that's a rare. Where, where are those four bases? There is one, and the reason I know this is this was very, very difficult to do, but I wanted to chart the directions these, uh, these, these orbs were flying in. So each case, I charted the direction. Okay. And I was able to back it up and see where they were coming from. How many cases did you chart? Uh, over 2,000. Wow. Yeah, I know. It was... Uh, that's the reason I, I told you I may not do another nonfiction book. It was, I spent a year researching this, an entire year. My publisher wasn't happy because mm -hmm. he wanted me writing novels. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, I was able to chart uh, where they were, they were going and where they came from it, with each orb. And I discovered they were, there were four points of origin they were coming from. One is Lake Erie. Another one is off the coast of Los Angeles. Uh, another one is off the coast of Miami. Okay. And a, another is off the coast of Sarasota, Florida, which okay. is on the western side in the, the Gulf. Gulf. Okay. And um, the, the Lake Erie now, would that be the Pennsylvania side or Ohio or where we're at up in there? I mean, uh, the, uh, the sightings, <clears throat> uh, there have been a number of, uh, not only uh, did I trace back where they're coming from? But there have been a number of sightings in each air, each area, underwater area I'm referring to. A number of witnesses have witnessed the orbs going into the water at these four sites. Yeah. Quite a few. And we've had have. a lot of cases yeah. with Ohio and, mm -hmm. and, and well, Pennsylvania right, people right, seen these right. come out, and it's been right. classic cases yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, of, of the orbs. Right. Let, let me ask you this too. Now you're saying like uh, the Fourth of July and that. Now Chinese lanterns. Could they be mistaken for Chinese lanterns, or could Chinese lanterns be mistaken for them? Well, you know what? I mean, I would say there's only one group of people that would describe orbs as Chinese lanterns, and those are people who haven't seen an orange orb. Okay. If you have seen an orange orb, there is no way you would ever say that that's a Chinese lantern. Orbs, first of all, are are round. They're spheres. Right. They are under. Uh, uh, very specific intelligent control. Right. <clears throat> they fly particular patterns. Right. When I first saw, when I saw orange orbs uh, in the summer of 2013, I watched uh, eight separate orbs about 10 minutes apart fly the exact same flight pattern. Hmm. Where was I mean, this as at? a military pilot, that's what Where? that's what you do as a pilot. You fly a flight pattern. Where was this at? This was in Ocean City, Maryland, okay. and it was about 10.30 at night, hmm. which is where, when they go home. And here's something interesting. Uh, the orbs that I saw, when they went, they were traveling from north to south, and as they were leaving, they headed southeast. After I read all these cases, I realized 
why they were going in this direction. They were on their way back. The, <clears throat> the orbs that are all along the east coast, the flap down the east coast, they're out of the Miami base. Mm -hmm. And so that's why at 1030 at night they were on their way south okay. back to the base. And if you spot them earlier in the evening along the east coast, they're coming from the south. Okay. And so... Uh, I, I had a thought when you said that they, they were orange and they looked like the setting sun. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that they're also out in the daytime, but if they're in the direct path of the sun, you wouldn't see them? They'd kind of blend in. They are occasionally uh, seen during the daytime, but it's interesting. Uh, most orange orbs fly at a rather low altitude. Okay. Uh, and they're, they're very, very visible. You can, I had binoculars when mm. I was sitting um, on the deck on the, on the balcony last summer. And, uh, but the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, orbs uh, can, uh, are very uh, clearly seen and um, they're, uh, they're very, uh, uh, very easily to describe, you know, being with Why the are they here? Why do you think, why do you think they're here? Um, this is a different phenomenon. Yeah. You know, I first heard about orbs maybe in the 70s, South right. Korea. They used to call them string of pearls, the, mm. and there were pictures of that. Right. You know, uh, even one of the famous cases with Captain Ruppelt, uh, I think it was the Montana case, it was uh, like a string of pearls, but they seem to be white orbs in the mm. sky. Yeah. Why are they here? Um, well, I, the whole time I was uh, researching, that was in the back of my mind. I wanted to find out what they're doing before I try to ask why are they here. And uh, to me it was, I had to put together a number of clues to, to try to conclude from their behavior, uh, why would they be behaving this, in this way? What's the reason behind it? Mm -hmm. And the first, the first thing I based uh, my, the, the why question upon is, is the, uh, the fact uh, that uh, they, uh, <clears throat> they are, um, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. Yeah, okay. Well, well we're going to go into why and why do you think, are they dangerous? How about are they dangerous? Is that the uh, question? Uh, yeah, you, uh, I, I did uh, deal with that uh, question, are they dangerous? Uh, first of all, uh, of all the cases I read, uh, there were uh, no reported injuries by anybody. Okay. And there were no, of course, you can't report your own death. Right, right. But there were, uh, there were was nobody, uh, you know, outside, you know, related to the person who was, uh, they are occasionally, the orange orbs vehicles don't abduct very often. Okay. They do occasionally. But, and the people who have been taken uh, have never reported an injury. They do, they do report, um, sometimes that there were rather disgusting things mm. done to them okay but there were no uh reports of injury that's one yeah secondly if they wanted to do harm to earth they would have done it a long time right. ago right and i'll tell you another reason i think at least right now i'd say they they come in peace mm -hmm. the orbs are seen uh, over every major city in the United States, every major city except one city. What city is that? Would you like to guess? D.C. Washington, D.C. Right. Do you have any reason for thinking it's Washington, D.C.? You're it's absolutely the right. It's most guarded airspace yes, it in the is. country. Right. Right. Ever since 9-11, uh, the, uh, uh, they have installed all sorts of defense mechanisms. They okay. have serviced air missiles. They have Andrews Air Force Base with jets right. on on alert plus flying the sky all the time and I think these are intelligent beings and they know that Washington is heavily guarded and they know if they penetrate that airspace they're going to be in a uh, they'll conflict. be combated yeah. yes and they're avoiding that okay so I, I don't think uh, they uh, intend us uh, any harm and um, the as to as to the why question, mm -hmm. uh, which I lost track right, there, right. Okay. they uh, they want to be seen, okay, and uh, 
The question is, why do they want to be seen? Mm. And why are they uh, presenting themselves in a very pleasant, non-threatening way? Um, and, what, and why have they changed from being stealthy to almost sort of like being on Broadway? Like, mm -hmm. here we are. And by the way, they do entertaining things sometimes. Yeah, I've heard that, yeah. the way they right, fly right. around. They will, seen, yeah. They'll be in a triangle, mm. blink out, then they're in a square, blink out. They, they react back. to flashlights. They do. Yeah. Right. Now, they don't, right. they don't re I'll tell you what, if you want one to stay around, use a flashlight, uh, but don't use a laser. Yeah, yeah. The lasers, if pointed toward uh, the orbs, they, they blink out immediately. Yeah. But anyway, uh, there's one case where they blinked out, came back on, and they're in the shape of the Big Dipper. Oh, okay. So they're entertaining. I think they want to appear non-threatening. And I think, my opinion, uh, what they're doing is they are, um, they are conditioning us to not be afraid of them. Okay. Okay? And I think here's the reason. They, they uh, I'm sure this is not the first time they've done this. I'm sure they're, they're uh, highly evolved technologically. Mm. They may have been around for thousands of years. They probably have been. And I'm sure they have uh, observed many other planets besides Earth. But I think they get to a certain point where they decide, we're going to go from stealthy observation to integration. In other words, integrating with the population. Okay. And I think... What they're doing is they are causing us not to be afraid of them. And by the way, there's more and more and more of these all around the world every year. Okay. And uh, I think they are uh, lead, and there are more and more landings with the uh, with the cosmic beings coming out. Okay. What, let, what, let me, what, what do they look like? Well, hold on one second. Okay. Don't, don't ask that question yet. Right. I read your book. Mm -hmm. And then I was kind of startled, and that's the next question as to what mm -hmm. do they look like. But let me first tell you this. This was in my book from 2009. This is something that happened to me at my house. I was awakened at 4.40 in the morning on September 1st, 2009, to a strange light. My bed sits where I can look right down my hallway. I wake up. I look down the hallway. The attic stairs is there. The doors open, which is what I usually do in the summer to let cold air come down. I see a guy standing there. I see somebody standing there, and it's backlit as though the attic light is on. The guy is very tall, like right to the door frame, 6'6", six, six, I'd say. Lanky arms, legs, very small waist, a 20-inch waist, and his head, like he's wearing a, 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 a crown on it, you know, a conical type mm. uh, shape to his head. And I wake up, and I'm looking, and I see this guy. And then I crawled, I actually crawled to the foot of the bed looking to get a closer view. He's still there. I was saying, mm. I'm awake. Mm. So I quickly rolled over, put the light on, and I, I looked, and, and he's not there anymore. And, uh, but then the light in the attic is out also. It was on just previously. Mm. So I lay back down in bed. Then all of a sudden, a light comes on outside of my house. Now, I know what the light looks like when they deliver the newspaper because it's a cul-de-sac. They come around. I see mm. the light. I can see the light turning. Right, right. This light is on, but it backs away. This, that turn isn't there. So now I'm going to ask you what I just described that this being looked like. It actually reminded me of the creature in District 9, if you ever saw that movie. Yeah. That's right. the, the long arms, legs, tiny little waist, tall, lanky, but it had the square head. Tell me, and I read that in your book, tell me what they look like based on your analysis. Well, they, the, uh, the beings that emerge from the crafts uh, inside the orbs uh, are of two types. There is the, uh, the very, very tall type. They are about eight to nine feet tall. They're very, uh, very thin, muscular, and... Um, they, uh, they are, are uh, they, their skin, they, they, all the witnesses that have seen them, a lot of them have seen them very close, close up, uh, they have some sort of shiny black fabric, mm -hmm. some sort of, uh, sort of like, almost like a bodysuit. Well, yeah, very mine was black, dark. Right. He, the person... and, and their faces are rather dark, and some, some people, they, uh, 
have various opinions on this. Their face are dark. Some believe that that is the f they have fabric over their face too. Some think it is dark skin. Okay. I don't know, but it's it's precisely what you're describing. Mm. They're uh, very muscular, long arms, and by the way, they have they're all described as having five fingers. Okay. Oh, you know, some of these right, reports right. say four. I've always thought that's a little odd. Like right. <laughs> usually, uh, sentient beings have an opposing thumb. You know, which you need. But anyway, that's one type. That's the type you saw. That's exactly what right. you described mm -hmm. in point forty one as right. a description. Right. I read that. It was yes. uncanny. Well, you saw one of the tall ones. Okay. And they're also very strong. They have been seen to uh lift and carry uh enormously heavy things. Uh you know, they've been seen right on, on the ground doing it. But there's also the smaller uh, beings that they uh, that travel with them. They're only about uh, four feet tall. They're not nearly as dark, and it's it's hard to make out from the descriptions of witnesses uh, what exactly is there. It's sort of uh, lighter colored, and and uh, no one has described exactly what is over if, whether they have fabric or mm -hmm. they don't have fabric. I've never read it in any of the reports, but uh, they are smaller. Their heads are uh, somewhat larger. And by the way, with the uh, with the <laughs> tall uh, with the tall beings, um, they describe their eyes as being very human-like, except larger. That's mm -hmm. all. You know, it's nothing odd-looking. It's just they're larger. But the uh, it's interesting with the with the the interactions between the tall beings and the small beings. They have been uh, witnessed on a number of occasions together. And it's interesting, uh, most of the people who have witnessed them together say it appears to be a parent-child relationship. Mm. Hmm. And the, uh, the tall, and, and here's, here's why uh, they say that, they describe what was going on. They say the, the tall ones are, are standing, it sounds like a playground, the tall ones are standing around and the small ones are are in within the the sort of the circle. They're not mm -hmm. an exact circle, but they're standing around, and they seem to be playing. The small ones. Uh, so um, I'm not sure what to make of that. Mm -hmm. But if it, it is possible, we could be dealing right. with parent-child relationship. Uh, but that's uh, that's who's uh, flying around in these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've done a tremendous amount of work in, in analyzing this. Now, you don't think that they're hostile, right? This particular species, because I'm of the opinion there are many different species of extraterrestrial here, and this is just one of them. I agree with you. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all I know is that... Uh, but there's been no cases of them doing uh, human mutilations, let's say. No. Well, there's okay. been, uh, as I said, there's been... Uh, I read over 2,000 cases, and there have been no reports of anyone being injured or killed. And uh, so I, I think they come in peace, and I think they've uh, reached the point, they made some decision collectively to go beyond, as I said, uh, being se secretly investigating things to being very visible to make us uh, not afraid of them, and they're, I think contact, my opinion, contact, I think is coming within the next few years. Okay. Let me ask you this now. Say, for example, you got one of these the size of a, of a, of a uh, basketball we're seeing. Oh, yeah. That's, Th those that, are the red orbs. Yeah, I mean, now, yeah. is that how big they are? Or oh, like, no, no, no. Or they, when you get inside them... You like what, 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 what you're saying there's two different sizes. Right. There's, they got to be huge to be seen in the sky. Right. Or there's the ones that are seen but, in houses but, coming but, in and out of houses. Yeah, but what I'm, red, what, what I'm saying is, John, if, if there's intelligent beings in them, it's like Travis Walton. Here's a little ship here, and once you get in a ship, it's a mile long. Mm -hmm. Is this the same thing with them? I don't think so, no. And, uh, and are they ghosts? Right. Are they right. some sort of spirits in the smaller ones? Right. All right. Well, let me do one at a time here. All right. There are <laughs> the, uh, I would say 95% of the orbs that are seen are the large orange ones. And right. when I say large, I mean uh, possibly 
a hundred yards wide. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, uh, they they are very large. But you have quite a few of the red ones. Right. Actually, I saw a red one. I reported it was mm -hmm. in Ohio. Uh, they're they're very small, and they uh, move at a speed that's scary. I was on the uh, Ohio Turnpike. And coming out of Lake Erie, I was going mm -hmm. by Lake Erie, it was to uh, my left, and uh, just north of me. Coming out of that direction, a, a red orb about 100 feet high, just to, in front of my car, went from horizon to horizon in about two seconds. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was frightening. I, I mean, uh, I remember that case. I investigated it. Yeah. Yes, well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're about out of time. Uh, you did an excellent uh, job on your book, and a lot of analysis, and Thank I you. hope. I hope you then move on to looking at triangles, but we're, that's our show for this week. <laughs>